Thank you so much, James. Uh, sorry about preempting the introduction, but uh, I appreciate all that and I appreciate all that you all do. So thanks for your great work here. Let me tell you a story. When Hurricane Katrina broke the levees of New Orleans, a few weeks later, I went back down there uh, with Wendy Kopp, who had helped found Teach for America. And we gathered what were the 250 core members of Teach for America in that city in the only hotel ballroom that was open, the Sheridan on Canal Street. We said to them, there is no school system. There won't be one until at least January. So, since you need to make a living, we will uh, send you to Baton Rouge, the Delta Country, Mississippi, Houston, Dallas, or if you want, you can stay in New Orleans and help build a new school system, but you're not gonna be making a salary. We'll try to get you a little stipend. Out of the 250 core members in that room that day, 250 stayed in New Orleans. And they, and they didn't decide to just rebuild the school system, they decided to build it new. The way you would build a school system if you had a whiteboard and you had the opportunity to start afresh. And the first thing you would think about is saying, I want for all kids what we had for our children, which is choice in the school they get to go to, competition among the schools to see who could be the best. So when we came back in January and the schools started opening, they were all charter schools, private, public, charter schools, all independent. But that's not that big of a deal. What really matters, we discovered, is making sure that the parents got to choose what school their kids went to. Because that notion of choice not only empowered each parent to become more involved and more of a believer, and every kid to say, I can find the, fits right, the fit that's right for me. It also made sure that if you were a school that people weren't choosing, you were gonna end up being shut down. And so there was a competition among the schools because people had the choice. It started early. There were three schools in my neighborhood of Broadmoor that came back. One won by KIPP Academies, another that was just locally chartered by the neighborhood, one a private school uh, in St. Rita's that had become open as part of the charter movement. Uh, the Green School, the one run by Kip Academy, decided why don't we stay open until 6 p.m. in the evening? The notion of turning a kid out on the streets in New Orleans at three in the afternoon didn't make a whole lot of sense especially since there was a lot of catching up to do. Well, just like if a Whole Foods market moves next to a Safeway or another food store and one puts in a really great fresh vegetable bar or whatever, the others have to follow. And soon the other two schools in that neighborhood were both staying open till 6 p.m. And speaking of vegetable gardens, one of the schools got Alice Waters, who really wanted to be helpful, a chef, from Berkeley, California, to create an edible schoolyard so the school lunches there could be grown by the kids. Well, that was such a good idea that schools around the city had to copy it because they were in competition. The money followed the students. That led to great innovation. Now, there are multiple ways to do innovation, and I do not recommend having a hurricane in order to be able to do it. So that innovation comes from things like ACE, too, where you're providing scholarships that give choice. There's not one path to great school reform, but there is a great vision behind all great school reform, which is you have to be innovative and you have to be creative, and that requires empowering every family, every kid, every parent to give them as much choice as possible. That's what you do through your scholarships. That's what we did in the new school system we tried to build. And that's what alumni, just like the Teach for America alumni, 
did in New Orleans, the alumni of your program will be able to find other ways to do innovation through vouchers, through scholarships, through school districts like New Orleans that are voucher without the V word, meaning the money follows the student. If you attract a student, you get the money for that student. All of that helped create a ecosystem of innovation and serving the families, as opposed to serving the teachers or serving the bureaucracy or serving the school board. We've had so much competition and innovation that we have to print guides up that sort of say each school so people can have a choice, just like if you get a restaurant guide or a movie guide. And it ranks the schools by all sorts of metrics, including the fact that some parents love school uniforms. And I could watch each year as you look down what are now 102 schools that are part of the Common Application Parental Choice Program. There'd be 20 of them that would have a little check mark by school uniforms. A few years later, there would be 25 or 30 of them. And you could watch how the notion of a competitive marketplace led people to figure out what works for some families and what doesn't work for some families. I also got to see, and just as I got choked up as every one of you did at the tales here, I got to see it through the eyes of students because certainly if you were in New Orleans after the storm, you ended up either adopting or having as a, 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 being a mentor for some kids who didn't have parents that made it back or uh, were living with distant relatives. And a couple of them stand out for me. You'll meet them someday because they'll be like Davon. They'll be on, well, they have been on stages like him. One was a kid named Troy Simon. Uh, Troy, I met him when I went to the Astrodome in Houston because we all went with some of the founders of KIPP Academy, the Teach for America Corps members, which is to try to get the kids home. There was a school there right next to the Astrodome run by KIPP called NOW. It stood for New Orleans West. It meant the kids from New Orleans who had moved west temporarily. They kept the name when they moved back. We moved the whole school back to New Orleans. Troy was in the Astrodome, but not part of the cadre at uh, the now school. His uh, brother had been arrested for armed robbery. His parents weren't in his life. Before he um, got swept away by the storm and ended up in Houston, he had been basically a pickpocket in the French Quarter, sometimes tap dancing for money, sometimes doing minor burglaries or robberies. But he was very quiet when I first met him, and he wouldn't talk about school. And I finally found out why he was in the sixth grade in theory, but he didn't know how to read. We had had a school system in New Orleans that got a kid all the way through fifth grade, even though he couldn't read. Now, to not coin a phrase, a uh, phrase that probably has grown a little bit too much moss around it. It kind of does take a village at times to do things. So we had not only Teach for America, but we had College Track and Posse. And Troy got enrolled in each of these type of programs, a scholarship at first. He was at Gentilly High School, which wasn't a very good school. And he wanted to move to Sci Academy, Science Academy, which was still in a FEMA trailer but even though it was in a FEMA trailer, it was doing better than other schools, and he knew it was a better school. Since he didn't have parents in his life, I had to be the one to help sign the application to make sure, but he got into Sci Academy, got into college track, learned how to read, actually written a couple of good stories. If I may say so now, he's at Yale University as a graduate student, having graduated from Bard College and he's coming back to New Orleans to start his own school because a good entrepreneurial person like, like Troy knows what he could do. I learned more from him, of course, than he learned from me as I watched him go through the progress, and I learned some of the trials and tribulations, even when he was at Bard on a scholarship. Bard was very good, he had his posse there, which was another program, but at one point I was coming up for a parents' weekend with my wife, and he said, uh, I can't, you know, I can't meet you like you, he said, I uh, said, why? He said, well, my phone's not working. I said, why is your phone not working? He said, well, it ran out of uh, my, the charge. I didn't, not electric charge, but the payment charge. 
And I said, oh, okay. And I realized, of course, that if you don't have a credit card, you can't get annual billing and stuff like that. So you have to go down to the phone store and pay month by month. So I said, well, I'll bring you to the AT&T store nearby. I walked in with him, and being the type of kid he is and what he looks like, they were basically not serving him until finally I walked up and said, he's with me, and put my Platinum American Express card to make the point. But I realized that at each step of the way, kids have a lot to overcome if they don't come from some of the backgrounds like we came from. And the way to make that work is to empower them and give them choices like an A scholarship program did. Now, you do it for private schools, and I have, well, I shouldn't say of course, but I went to a private school when I was growing up in New Orleans. And the other kid I got to know is named James White. And you meet both of these people. These are not composite figures. These are real guys. You'll meet someone, James in Aspen, because he's working there this summer. I saw Jay Mills. I'll make sure Jay gets to know James. But James's mother was a janitor at the Newman School, which happened to be the school I went to many years ago. And um, he would walk from his school late in the afternoon to Newman to walk his mother home. And she was a cleaning lady there, wonderful, beloved at the school. But every day he would come in and he would say to his mom, I, I want to go to this school. And she'd say, well, no, you can't go to this school. And she didn't quite explain. And James would say, no, no, this school is nicer. This school has computers. This school, they aren't fighting. This school, and he kept saying it. I'm getting choked up here, but uh, Sarah used in who was one of the people from the Aspen Institute who moved to New Orleans to start new schools in New Orleans, had a kid there and had heard this from the woman who was the janitor. And so a fund just like ACE was started, and James ended up the next year going to Newman. Uh, last year he graduated from Cornell. He'll be working at the Aspen Institute, but he's going to go on to get his engineering degree at Tulane. These are the type of lives that you all touch every day. You have your formula. There are many formulas for it. But always keep in mind, it's about those kids. It's about our kids. It's about our nation's kids and our community kids and giving them the choices and opportunities that we would insist that our own kids would have. It's a difficult process. You have to be open-minded and learn along the way. Benjamin Franklin, who was quoted here earlier, one of my biography subjects, he formed a club called the Leather Apron Club when he was a runaway in Philadelphia and had just gone to work in a printing shop. And the club was dedicated to things like this, which is civic improvement. How are we each and every way going to improve uh, our community? And they started various things, the Street Sweeping Corps, uh, militia, the first volunteer fire department. On his deathbed, Franklin still had the bucket from the volunteer fire department because you were supposed to keep it by your bed. And one of the things they started was the Academy for the Education of Youth in Philadelphia. That was for all people of all walks of life. It's now called the University of Pennsylvania, but it started off as an Academy for the Education of Youth. But as he did it, he said, we have to continue to innovate. And this is something we've not done in our society. Because I fear that if Ben Franklin walked into any high school, whether it be in Denver, New Orleans, New York, he'd say, oh yeah, that's just like the high school I created. Sort of blackboard up front, rows of desks, whatever. And one reason we haven't had as much innovation is we haven't had the type of competition and choice that we have in other industries. And secondly, we have to always do what Ben Franklin said, which is, don't be guided by ideology. By gui be guided by what works. And he always made a list of the experiments he needed to do to say what's working and what's not working. And he did that especially in the field of education in Philadelphia. They, in that club, made a list of the virtues you had to have in order to be successful if you're going through one of the academies for the education of youth, if you were going to be at a table like these 
as somebody who was successful. If you've read the autobiography of Ben Franklin, you may know the list. Industry, honesty, frugality, all these little uh, traits or character traits. And they would mark each week whether they had each member of the club had been faithful to each of those traits. And one week, Benjamin Franklin had mastered all 12, he said. He showed it around to the members of his club with great pride. And one of the people in the club said to him, you know, Franklin, you need to add a virtue to your list. You might want to try occasionally. Franklin said, what's that? And the friend said, humility. You might want to put that one on the list. Now, Franklin says uh, in a letter to his sister, I never mastered the virtue of humility. I never could master it. I could never conquer it. But I was good at the pretense of humility. I learned to fake it very well. But here's the genius of Franklin. He said, and it taught me that the pretense of humility is just as useful as the reality of humility because it makes you have to listen to the people around you, try to figure out what they are thinking, and keep your mind open for where you might be wrong and where you need to experiment and innovate. And he said, and that was the essence of the middle class tradesman democracy we were trying to form then. We always need to figure out the metrics of success. Alex was talking to me on the way here about what are the different metrics you measure when you do schools. Clearly, graduation rates, a really big one, a really high one. You took my breath away when you said you hit 100% this past year. I know how hard that is. But we always have to be looking at a whole variety of metrics because sometimes uh, the metrics are uh, gamed by the system. And so in New Orleans, I don't want to tell you that we've mastered this whole game. Every year, we have to look at things like a school that's doing very, very well. It was Psy Academy, actually. And the kid who had been a Teacher of America Corps member around it, Ben Markman, said, we're doing well, but we're about to get slammed by the newspaper because we have the highest rate of suspensions and expulsions. And you have to explain to them that we also have the highest rate of students whose parents or fathers are in parish prison, and the highest is that and the other. I said, yeah, but expelling a kid, he said, well, and we need to because we're measured on graduation rates, learning and stuff, and if a kid's gonna be disruptive, we have to remove him so we can do well on the metrics. I said, you know what, I'm not sold. The best way to argue against that article is to say, we're innovative, and next year we're gonna have zero expulsions. He said, well, that'll cost money. And I said, yeah, we'll have to raise the money. But we'll have to figure out a room in the school, a psychologist, a way to handle the kids not working out rather than saying it's 11 a.m. You now have to go out on the streets because uh, we're kicking you out. These are the types of sort of openness and humility that as we march down the road to reforming schools, we have to keep remembering it's a difficult process. There's not exactly one answer. There's scholarships and there's vouchers and there's charters and there's public and private and everything else. But it's going to be a long road because we've done so little in education reform for much of our country's history. But the most important thing is like Franklin when he formed his club, to remember that we're part of things larger than ourselves. That there's a noble calling that's both selfless and ideal of realizing that the next generation should have greater opportunities than ours and that all kids should have a chance and an opportunity for a good education. In 2011, I had been writing about Steve Jobs and at the end of the summer it was clear that he wasn't gonna keep outrunning the cancer. And so I was sitting in his backyard and I said to him, what did it all mean? What was, you know, you've been just so successful, one of the most successful people in America's history. What does it mean, you know, what was your motivating force? And he said, well, when I was building my career and I was young, I had my Zen Buddhist training and I thought life was like a river. And the river had really great things in it that different people had made, they had invented, 
concepts they had come up with, ideas that go in the river. And if you were successful, you got so many of those things out of the river and you got to enjoy them. But now I realize that it's not how much you get out of the river, it's what you get to put into the river that really matters. What the next generation, the generation after will say, because you were here and you put something in that river. And as for Ben Franklin, he donated to the building fund of each and every church that was built in Philadelphia his entire lifetime. And at one point they were building a new hall right next to Independence Hall, still called the New Hall. And if you write a fundraising document, you can read that. He wrote the best, and the first sentence said, even if the Mufti of Constantinople were to send somebody here to teach us about Islam and the Prophet Muhammad, we should offer a room and listen, for we might learn something. And on his deathbed, he was the largest individual contributor to the Mikvah Israel Synagogue, the first synagogue built in Philadelphia. So when he died, instead of his minister accompanying his casket to the grave, all 35 ministers, preachers, and priests linked arms with the rabbi of the Jews and marched with him to the grave. That's what they were fighting for back then, and that's what we're still fighting for around the world and here at home and in rooms like this today. Thank you all very much.